Sergi Bala has been one of the most creative authors on a variety of global economic topics for many years. Uh, he took on this uh, initiative several years ago, and we worked on it extensively with lots of study groups to which many of you uh, participated, uh, and developed what I think is an incredibly creative and uh, innovative analysis of the way in which exchange rate policy has interacted with development strategy uh, across not just the years and decades, but across the centuries, uh, and across, as I say, a wide variety of countries. So it really tackles some cosmic economic issues uh, and does so in a way that I think is enormously creative in both analytical terms, uh, using a whole variety of, uh, of econometric and statistical techniques, but also in terms of the ba basic and crucial questions that it asks and tries to answer. Uh, the title, Devaluing to Prosperity, uh, was actually inspired by our colleague Ted Truman, who's not here today. Uh, but Ted has chided me and others over the years for believing that anybody could devalue to prosperity. Uh, he regarded that as an oxymoron, impossible to devalue to prosperity. Well, this book suggests that there are some notable cases, uh, including at the moment, where it has been done, is being done, and raises significant issues for other countries and indeed the global system uh, as a result. Uh, many of you know our author, Sergi Bala. He's written for the Institute before. He did another very creative book for us uh, a few years ago um, with, uh, with apologies to John Lennon. We called it Imagine There's No Country, uh, Poverty, Inequality, John Lennon, right? Imagine yeah. There's No Country. Yes, um, that was taken explicitly from that uh, reference. And that had to do with poverty, inequality, and growth in an era of globalization. Uh, Sergi brings a, a very unusual array of expertise to the topic. He did his PhD in economics at Princeton. He's worked at the World Bank, uh, the Rand Corporation, um, uh, taught at the Delhi School of Economics, uh, published widely. So his academic credentials are uh, are uh, impeccable, uh, but he's also worked extensively in the private sector at Goldman Sachs, at Deutsche Bank, uh, in the Treasury Department at the World Bank, uh, and he now is managing director of a hedge fund uh, and money management firm in, uh, in New Delhi called Oxus Research and Investments. Um, so he comes at it from the private market experience as well, and he has had uh, of an array of advisory positions to governments. So he's worked at the World Bank, but he's also been on a number of commissions in his native India having to do with capital account convertibility, having to do with the statistical system. So at all levels, uh, Sergi has been uh, deeply involved in the workings of the world economy, uh, his own country, India, of course, but much more widely. He brings an unusual diversity and depth of skills and expertise and experience to this topic, and I'm delighted to introduce him today, Sergi Bala. Thank you very much, John, for uh, Fred, sorry, uh, for that introduction. You can see I was so <laughs> absorbed in that. Um, you know, basically on exchange rates, uh, and Fred mentioned in the end as to how I manage uh, a hedge fund, that if you will, my first familiarity uh, with exchange rates uh, was back in the early 1980s, um, before the Plaza Agreement, and when I started dabbling in currency values uh, with Liaquat. So I don't know if you remember. So uh, there is, if you will, practical experience um, that I hope I, I bring to bear in this research. Um, I'll go over, I think there's a handout uh, which has both a, a guide to the book in terms of um, the chapters, uh, but I'll go over some of the conclusions or some of the findings, if you will, and uh, then we can take it from there. Um, one. Uh, <clears throat> If you will, the, the start for this is that historically, if one looks at, and this is 
I, I don't discuss it in the book that much, but I think there is a more than a coincidence that some of the major financial crises uh, that regions have faced and the world has faced are preceded by, if you will, currency crises or currency imbalances. Um, so you can think of the 1980 to 1982 Latin American debt crisis, the Plaza Agreement of 1984, the 1992 British pound crisis, uh, 1994 Mexican peso, 97 to 98 East Asian crisis, um, and then the Great Recession uh, 2008 onwards, and not to mention the Eurozone crisis, which we have just going through, and which is now in, I guess, 2010 onwards. Um, and so that, if you will, underlines the importance of uh, getting the currency values right uh, for the global uh, economy, as it were, uh, or for individual countries. And if they don't get it right, uh, then uh, clearly there are repercussions beyond their borders. Um, crises in, in uh, currency values lead to global imbalance uh, in the current account, and that I just want to emphasize the global, global account is always in balance. So therefore, total savings in the world are equal to the total investments. But there is imbalance in that most of the, or a few countries may have the surpluses, and a few countries may have most of the deficits. And that's what causes uh, problems, if you will. Let's, you know, one example of the importance of um, currency values, if you will, is in the Eurozone crisis. And, you know, the Euro was formed on January 1st, 1999, and really nobody talked about uh, that this would induce a financial and a currency crisis. Um, and one of the reasons that I think and I offer as to why we didn't note that the entire structure uh, of the uh, Eurozone as constructed in 1999 would likely lead to a crisis is that it came in at a value of 1.18 uh, on January 1st, 1999, and promptly started depreciating. Uh, and the Euro went down to as little as 0 0.79 or thereabouts in 2001. And it was not till 2004 that the Euro uh, came back to the uh, value above 1.18. And if you note that 2005 is when we started noting uh, the, currency, the current account problems in the tier one and the tier two economies. So the tier two economies, uh, also known as pigs, uh, state, started having a current account deficit as much as seven to eight percent of GDP back in 2005. <laughs> And you know the world didn't recognize it as such, uh, but really the seeds of the crisis were sown in terms of the exchange rate values uh, being identical uh, across uh, countries that were vastly different in per capita incomes. Um, and uh, if you will, it was not sustainable. Now, the regions in America, uh, or regions in India, um, also are, are very, very disparate, and yet they have the same currency and don't have a problem, which is uh, the reason being there is a fiscal side which tries to balance some of these effects, and that is what the Eurozone uh, countries are now attempting to do. So that's just to illustrate that, listen, uh, we have a, a problem when currency values uh, are not, quote unquote, aligned. But how do we know that currency values are not aligned? How do we know that currency values are stable and at quote unquote fair values? And there are methods by which we, we can observe the current account um, and, and see if the current account is in deficit, then basically the uh, currency is overvalued, broadly speaking, and if the current account is in surplus, the currency is undervalued. But how much and where should the checks and balances or where should the, the adjustment occur, we do not know. Um, so therefore, there are measures uh, or attempts to measure the real exchange rate and the deviation from the real exchange rate. Um, and, uh, and therefore, that deviation is how much, uh, if you will, uh, error there is in the currency value. Now, the IMF and the BLS, and this is important, the IMF and the BLS have a measure of the real exchange rate. And that measure of the real exchange rate takes some base here uh, and looks at how the currency values have changed uh, 
uh, from that base here, and you can have a basket of currencies, and uh, how the inflation rates have differed, and therefore you adjust everything to that base here and find out that relative to that base here has the currency depreciated in real terms or not appreciated in real terms. Now, and thereby you come at uh, with a measure of how much uh, currency uh, is undervalued or overvalued. Now, there are problems uh, with that kind uh, of an estimate. And the major problem with that kind of estimate, and this is what uh, the study shows for analysis of over 180 countries over more than 100 years, is that a lot of the currency adjustment that is needed is really comes across from what is the Belasa Samuelson effect. That is, if your productivity is higher, or the growth of productivity is higher than another country and then the numerare country, then your currency needs to appreciate, broadly speaking. Not by the same amount as your productivity growth, but by, if you will, uh, an elasticity of that, uh, or by a, a multiple of that, and that multiple is normally less than one. And that is, if you will, a major, major influence. And let me illustrate that with the example of what has happened in China over the last 2005 is when the Chinese currency went on a free float, not a free float, sorry, take that back, went on a, a float, which an interventionist float, and they decided to allow their currency to appreciate in obviously well-regulated amounts. Between 2005 and 2012, 2004 starting, uh, starting 2005, basically the currency is appreciated by some nominal exchange rate is appreciated by something like uh, 25%. And that is what a lot of people are saying, listen, our currency is appreciated and uh, you know, uh, we are doing our bit to redress currency imbalances. So that's 25%, that's not a small number. Indeed, if you look at relative inflation in China versus the numerator, which is the dollar, uh, which is the U.S. inflation, U.S. In inflation has been about 15 percentage points less than Chinese inflation on a cumulative basis between 2005 to 2012. So now we get to a number which is 40 percent. So the Chinese currency has appreciated 40 percent in the last seven years. Now, before going into does it have any effect on the current account or has it had any effect on the current account, it also is the case that basically China needed to appreciate its currency by, if you will, 50 percent. Because it has higher productivity growth, it's moving up the income scale, relative prices, etc., and that's as well discussed in the book and or familiar to most of you. So basically, China should have appreciated by 50 percent, which means Conclusion that in 2012, the Chinese currency is 10% more undervalued than it was in 2005. Very simple, straightforward math, if you will, and that all comes out from, if you will, measuring uh, the, uh, the productivity effects and how much the elasticity of the productivity effects is in. Now, there have been several measures of doing that. And uh, one very popular measure is the log-log method, et cetera, where you look at the real exchange rate and estimate what the elasticity is with respect to real income, uh, and you find out that that estimate is something like 0.25 or 0.3. That means for each 1% extra productivity growth in an economy, the exchange rate should appreciate by 0.3. What I offer in here is that there is a, indeed the, the constant elasticity relationship between exchange rates and um, uh, between the real exchange rate and per capita income is not at all a unitary in a, in a, in a log sense, not, a, not at all a constant in the log sense, but is really an S-shaped curve. And that is one of the, if you will, innovations in the book, and we'll, I'll soon talk about as to whether it works or not, but basically that at very low levels of income, uh, where a country is very, very poor, then it doesn't, uh, growth in incomes will not lead to an appreciation, or should not lead to an appreciation in the exchange rate. Uh, they are too far away from the frontier, if you will, for that to happen. But once you get in the middle income category, the elasticity is as much as about 1, 1.1. 1 
And once you get to the top end, where you're comparing Europe versus Japan versus the US, then the elasticity gets down to about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So therefore, productivity growth differences do not really matter at the top, do not really matter at the bottom, but they really matter a lot in the middle. And in the middle is where China is, and that elasticity is 0 0.8. Remember I said that the log-log method, which is the traditional method which has been used, gives you an average elasticity of 0 0.3, which is the same for the US, which is the same for India, which is the same for Ethiopia. And uh, if you will, empirically, it's not warranted. Now, how do we know? I can state it empirically is not warranted. And the, the, the book, if you will, conducts several tests to find out whether this measure of the real exchange rate and therefore the currency undervaluation or overvaluation works in explaining phenomena that uh, we are familiar with, apart from growth rates, which is what ultimately I want to get to. Um, and the two phenomena that this measure really explains exceedingly well, one is a US current account. Um, and the U.S. current account and changes in the U.S. current account uh, are well explained by this and, if you will, by this measure of the real exchange rate and undervaluation or overvaluation, much, much better than even the Fed's own broad index, which is a measure of the real exchange rate that the U.S. government publishes. And, if you will, it is so the performance of this model in explaining differences and changes in the U.S. current account and the graphs in the book that show you how well the fit is, is quite, uh, if you will, uh, remarkable. The other uh, remarkable, uh, if you will, uh, achievement of this measure is in explaining, uh, if you will, the entire current account differences uh, that have occurred in the Eurozone countries, within the Eurozone, between the Tier 1 countries and the Tier 2 countries, and really it's almost as close to a perfect fit as you can get, that as the real exchange rate in the Tier 2 countries appreciated with respect to Germany, uh, basically their current account got worse. So these are just two, if you will, uh, examples of how uh, well uh, the exchange rate measure works and, if you will, justifies. And indeed, I do the calculations with the traditional measure of uh, measuring uh, the exchange rate and deviations thereof, and they don't work uh, that well. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> the, other, the other, actually, in terms of the fit of explaining real exchange rates, uh, when you do it with um, across a broad uh, 180 countries from 1996 to 2009, that 86% of the variation in the real exchange rate is explained by this measure, by per capita income on the, on the right-hand side, by this nonlinear measure, and the traditional measure would only explain about 50. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want to get to um, some of the other results now with respect to growth. Um, and one important result is that it's really the effect of currency valuation uh, deviation, if you will, on growth is symmetric. That is, a 10% overvaluation hurts growth by uh, the same magnitude as a 10% undervaluation helps growth. And that is 10% basically leads to about a 0.2 percentage change, but the magnitudes are the same, and that is what I want to emphasize. The other uh, important, uh, if you will, result is that changes in undervaluation uh, also matter. And the channel in all of this, and there's a whole chapter devoted to this, where does this work? It really works through investment. So what, we, while we are getting to explaining growth, which is a reduced form if you will, uh, explanation or reduced form target, uh, the real effect is coming through investment. And the reason it's coming through investment or the explanation for why it's coming through investment, it decreases costs. So if your currency is undervalued relative to another currency, costs of production are lower in your country than in elsewhere. So profitability of investment is indeed high. Now, so therefore, then there are tests explaining uh, how well uh, this measure does uh, explain investments and therefore growth. And then I, there's a whole chapter devoted to, if you will, what in the literature is called horse races. And the horse race has to do with what about all the other determinants 
of growth that we know about. And the most popular one over this decade really has been institutions, that, and Western-style institutions. And there are a lot of literature, a lot of very, very uh, good literature has come out with estimates that Western-style institutions uh, really help growth. Um, and indeed are the most important determinant of growth. And so therefore in a head-to-head -head run uh, and looking at institutions and various uh, instruments uh, for institutions, etc., um, basically it turns out that if you have currency valuation and changes in currency valuation on the right-hand side and growth or level of per capita on the left-hand side, less than 23% of cases, and there were more than 1,000 cases examined, less than 23% of the cases is the institution variable significant. And if it were, there are eight institution variables, so it's not as if one of them is chosen. Um, and uh, whereas uh, the currency valuation measure is significant in 75% of the cases tested. So this is just to emphasize, now before I get to the consequences, this is just to emphasize that first a measure of exchange rate undervaluation is offered, then it is tested against a variety of uh, circumstances, if you will, against a variety of other determinants, and then the conclusion is reached that uh, you can devalue your way uh, to prosperity. But if that is the case, then why isn't every country doing it? And indeed, I show how uh, the overall aggregate undervaluation measure in the world and the number of countries practicing currency undervaluation has really uh, shot up. It was the global net currency valuation level moved from an average overvaluation of about 10% for the 1970 to 2000 period to an average undervaluation level of 11% in 2010 11. Is con currency undervaluation a zero sum game? And then I argue uh, that to a large extent it is. If there are small countries that practice currency undervaluation, then really the world can absorb it. But if it's a big player, that practices this and in a, a reasonable magnitude. And just to give you an example, the magnitudes found for the East Asian economies, uh, China I mentioned was about 50% undervalued. So the fair value of uh, the yuan is something like 3.8 or thereabouts. Um, that the uh, East Asian economies like Malaysia, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, um, etc. are, if you will, the major culprits in this. But the most important, um, if you will, uh, culprit uh, as far as currency, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know if it's a politically correct word to say a currency manipulation is concerned, is China with a very, very large undervaluation level. And it is a very, very large economy. And on that, actually, just to illustrate how large the economy is and how much of a political game this all is. Uh, you know that every year and now even in this election, their movement to brand, you know, one camp will say to the other camp, uh, you know, China should be branded as a currency manipulator, etc. And uh, obviously nothing will happen, but it is obviously very, very political. And I want to illustrate how political this all is, uh, that we might, as theoreticians, claim that, listen, all of this, you know, how can nominal exchange rate uh, affect the real variables? But as far as policymakers in the world are concerned, and especially developing world are concerned, they don't have these arguments. They go ahead and do it. Um, and uh, one example of this is as follows, that in, you know, we have, how do we get estimates, PPP estimates? We get them from uh, international comparison of prices surveys that are done every so often. The first one was done in 1970, which had 12 countries, of which India was one. Then another one was done in 1985. Uh, then a subsequent one in 1993. And the final one to date was done in 2005. And here's something quite interesting about the survey done in 2005. What it showed was that if today or yesterday you saw China's income was 100, 
Okay, let's start with the price level, which is, after all, it is done through international comparison of prices. So if you found yesterday China's uh, price level was 100, today the price level went up to 140. So immediately, 40%, if you will, decline in the real income in China overnight. How did this happen? Well, China was never really part of any of the previous surveys. So therefore, what people had done, and this is pen tables, visa scholars, etc., what they had done was make some broad estimates about China's price level, and therefore its real exchange rate, um, and uh, you know, come to the conclusion that it was 100, whereas now, where China was part of the system, was part of the price comparison, that it went up to 140. One reason it may have gone up to 140 is that the survey was done only in urban areas of China. And China has now urbanization rate of upwards of 40%. The survey was done only in urban areas of China. And if you look at India, the urban price level is about 50% higher than the rural price level. So there are explanations and maybe it was not 40, maybe it was 20. Yeah, it comes out of the wash. Something else happened with the same ICP survey financed by the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, and maybe some members in the audience had worked on it. And that was that India's price level was increased by 40% overnight. Now, India has had more price service than their people in India throughout time. So therefore, there is no explanation possible. And, and indeed, the Indian economists minutely will look at the price surveys and say this is 0.1% higher and this is not accurate, etc. So how did it happen that overnight India's price level, aggregate price level is 40% higher, exactly the same as China? That is the importance of currency wars and their games. Now, one other implication of this was that in 2008, by what we knew yesterday, China's GDP exceeded that of the US. So the US was, what, 14 and a half trillion in 2008, and China's PPP income was 14 and a half trillion in 2008. And today is, what, 10, 15, 20% higher than that of the US, aggregate. I'm not talking per capita, I'm talking aggregate GDP. And now the IMF has come up with estimates in 2018, China will exceed that of the US in PPP terms. So the next time you see that statistic, uh, indeed, you should begin to wonder. Uh, as I wondered when this data first came out, uh, and I wrote an article saying all Asians were dead in 1950 because you took the per capita income level that they had and the growth rates that the ICP program provided, and it turned out that they were all much below subsistence level in 1950. We were all dead in 1950. But I want to emphasize that this is, uh, if you will, something that um, we all as uh, uh, as, as, if you will, citizens of the world, um, given that there is a proclivity and there's a relationship between what happens uh, with currency values, uh, especially when large countries practice uh, manipulation, that there are consequences. And I, you know, I don't want to emphasize the point too much, but there is uh, reasonable grounds to think that the East Asian crisis, and you know, indeed uh, the very first paper that I wrote on this was called, and I don't know if I uh, should claim authorship to the term currency wars, but there was an article in 1998 saying currency war, Chinese mercantilism, currency wars, and how the East was won. And that was done in 1998 in relationship to why was there an East Asian crisis uh, because of the lack or loss of competitiveness of the other Asian countries uh, with respect to uh, China. So, and then I think that there are arguments to be made as to why the, the crisis that we have just been through, are still going through, has to some extent uh, the contributive factor is uh, about currency values um, in some parts of the world. Um, let me give you one other example, which I certainly found striking, uh, 
uh, and you know, here's a real exchange rate, and this is done through an S-shaped curve, and then I get the deviation, and then I regress it on something. You know, who knows what's all is going on? Uh, but if you're interested, the book does document. But I want to give you the following statistic: that between 1500 and 1980, 480 years, China and India had more or less the same per capita income. This is Madison's study, etc. So for 480 years, we had the same per capita income plus minus 10 percent. Okay. From 1980 to 2012, China's per capita income is now almost three times, three and a half times that of India. Whether you look at it in US dollar terms or whether you look at PPP terms, it doesn't really matter. But let's take US dollar terms, okay? Because we know exchange rates can't be affected by policy and so on and so forth, or real exchange rate can't be affected. Well, let's look at wages in China and educational levels in China during the period 1980 to 2010. That Every year, the average education level of a Chinese worker was about two and a half to three years more than the education level, average education level, quality, not even controlling for quality, just in terms of magnitudes. And I think the quality of a Chinese worker is significantly higher, quality of education in China is significantly higher uh, than the quality of education in India, but I don't even want to take that route. So, they are, uh, Chinese workers, two and a half to three years higher um, education level. So you would expect their wages to be somewhat higher than India. And also the growth rate in China has been phenomenal, has been very, very high. And you'd expect that excess demand for labor causes wages to go up, blah, blah, blah. So in dollar terms, you would expect that the Chinese wage level would be higher than that of India by approximately a factor of two, two and a half, one and a half to two and a half, all other things being equal. In reality, Chinese wages in dollar terms until 2010 were lower than that of an Indian wage. That, if you will, is an example of currency intervention, currency manipulation, which doesn't involve the political players in, in the US or in Europe or anywhere else, just if you will, India versus China, that you have, and even today, the Chinese wage level and the Indian wage level are about equal, notwithstanding the fact that they are at a much, much higher uh, three times per capita income level than India, and if you will, have a higher educational level. Um, one last now for a little bit about the future. And <clears throat> I mentioned that yes, you can devalue your way to prosperity, uh, an individual country can, but there are consequences. And the consequences I mentioned had to do with global crises and other countries saying this is not fair and therefore indulging in currency wars or if you will, response to the beggar thy neighbor policy of one country is then, uh, if you will, retaliated against by another country. Uh, and, you know, we've, the world is still going through its greatest financial crisis. Um, and I, what I read uh, from, if you will, examination of the data, as well as uh, what the policymakers are doing, as well as an understanding of the consequences of this, is that I think I, I turn out to be very optimistic about the future. And maybe it's because I am DNA++, um, that I never ever see a glass less than three quarters full and always think it should not only be full but should brim over the top. Uh, but I think there are, there are logical reasons um, and even a pessimist will come to this conclusion that the world indeed has paid a very, very high price, continues to pay a high price in terms of employment, in terms of growth, in terms of uh, uh, whatever variable you want to look at and that there is a collective um, if you will, behavior um, and a collective positive behavior that never again would the world go through what it has gone through over the last five years. And on that note, I'll end my presentation. Okay. <laughs>